Thanks so much for that introduction and welcome to our cybersecurity panel. I'm thrilled to have this panel of experts with us today. And just as a reminder, even though we've recorded this session, we are available live in the chat to answer your questions. So recorded becomes interactive in our virtual world. So let me start out by asking each of our panelists to give us just a, a quick, maybe 60 second introduction about yourself and your, where you're coming from in terms of your expertise with cybersecurity. Alex, I'd like to start with you, if I may. That's what happens when you, your first name starts with the letter A. Thanks so much. I'm Alex Rakovitz spiegel I'm the co-founder and COO of Choice Cybersecurity. We partner with MSPs to provide them robust uh, and their clients robust compliance and advanced security solutions. Uh, basically, I just simplify regulatory compliances like NIST, CMMC, GDPR, ISO 27001, as well as cybersecurity best practices um, through industry-leading risk assessments, continuous compliance services, and state-of-the-art uh, security resources. I'm also the chair of the CompTIA uh, cybersecurity community. And with that role, I now also serve on the CompTIA Community Executive Council. Uh, so I just wanted to take a quick chance to also highlight on some of our really exciting 2021 initiatives um, in our community. We're doing different compliance regulations that are facing our industry like CMMC, NIST, and HIPAA and their associated challenges affecting all of our clients. Um, we're also taking a deep look at the MSP technical tool stack and in this uh, new remote work environment and how this toolbox has really evolved over time and is impacted um, as well as the solutions needed to evolve to this new remote work uh, environment that we're all living in. Um, and then updating the CompTIA Trustmark framework um, through the initial risk assessment and the audit process. Our overall goal is to make it really smooth and a uh, full automated uh, software platform. So we've got some really exciting initiatives in our community this year that I'm super pumped about. I'd say that's some great stuff that'll be coming. We're especially looking forward to the Trustmark update. That'll be uh, that'll have a lot of impact with what we're doing here with the CompTIA ISO. Um, Jay Ryersey, let me toss it over to you next. Thanks, MJ. I'm Jay Ryersey, VP of Cybersecurity Initiatives at ConnectWise. Uh, my background, um, while I am a CISSP, my background comes from the MSP space. I owned an MSP, sold it many, many years ago before it was fashionable to do so. I uh, started a cybersecurity company that was acquired by Continuum. And in the last, uh, I don't know, 14 months ago or so, we were adopted into the ConnectWise family. Today, I spend all my time um, on the IT Nation team working with our partners to enable them from a how to go to market, how to understand how to build your stack, how to package your price, how to build a security practice. You know, when, when those of us that are really good at IT, you know, make that pivot into cybersecurity. So I'm excited to be here. Great, thanks, Jay. Tracy, let me have you go next. Thanks, MJ. So Tracy Holtz, I'm the interim uh, North America security lead at Tech Data. So I've been with Tech Data for about 23 years of which about 18 years of that has been leading cybersecurity vendors, um, go to market sales teams and helping our partners build cybersecurity practices. So really excited to participate today um, on the panel. And I sit on the um, co-chair on the cybersecurity board as well as on the ISL. So really excited about the projects we have ahead of us, uh, working collaboratively together to help in the community really solve what the complexity is today in security, as well as um, helping bring some new park projects like our executive uh, business summaries and things that we'll launch this year. Great, thanks Tracy. And I'll just add Jay's humble, but Jay sits on our uh, executive advisory council for the ISAO. So I wanna, wanna make sure we give you a shout out for that. Sam, let me have you go next, please. Yes, uh, my name is Sam Spector. I joined BlackBerry in uh, January of 2021, where I serve as Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, I am also uh, presently chair of CompTIA's newly launched Federal Cybersecurity Committee. Prior to this, I was a senior cyber policy advisor in the office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, where I supported the implementation and oversight of uh, DOD cyberspace policy, including in engagements with the Congressional Defense Committees, as well as the DOD's participation on the US Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, before DOD, I was counsel to the House Energy and Commerce Committee for about 
seven years. Great. Thank you, Sam. Jacob. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm probably the odd one out here, work for the Hartford Insurance Company, and, uh, and so not um, the uh, cybersecurity background of my, uh, my fellow panelists here. But um, what we do is, obviously, we offer cyber insurance um, to uh, cover companies against the consequences of cyber attacks. And um, beyond just the cyber insurance, we have a number of, of different um, services we offer, um, security ratings, um, free training, uh, a wealth of different services. So we, we try and be more of an end-to-end um, cyber insurance and services um, provider. And we work a ton with particularly small businesses, uh, including tech companies. Um, and when cyber insurance is offered to tech companies, it's usually known as tech e &O coverage. Well, you're truly not the odd man out. I promise you that. I think the uh... I think the insurance industry is, has done some really good things in terms of forcing technology companies and really all companies to, to focus on, on cyber issues. But we'll, we'll definitely be talking about that during this session. So, you know, first question I want to throw out to each of you, and actually before I do, I just want to comment that, that the diversity of this panel was intentional because CompTIA has a, quite a few cybersecurity initiatives, as you've heard. So we have representation from our ISAL, from our Cybersecurity Committee, from our Cybersecurity Advisory Council, from our Federal Cybersecurity Committee, and now from a partner um, who's helping to work in the cyberspace for us as well. So each of these people are here because they bring a very specific area of expertise to the table and represent one of these important initiatives within CompTIA. So we're really in 2021 trying to bring this all into focus and and the ISAO is is leading the way as a hub for for cyber within CompTIA. So let me ask you all the the the, the famous question that that's tough to answer, but um, what keeps you up at night when you think about cybersecurity issues? Sam, let me let me start with you. You've got a you've got an interesting perspective on this, I think. Sure. No, thank you very much. Uh, while some may have initially identified or labeled the SolarWinds breach as an act of war. I think the consensus since then has been that the incident is better classified as an intelligence collection operation by an adversary. While the cost of uh, mitigation to government and industry will be significant, and it may take time to restore public confidence in the integrity of our cyber ecosystem, for me, a nightmare scenario would involve the adversary using their accesses to sabotage, destroy, manipulate, or disrupt data owned by or physical infrastructure controlled by governmental and private sector entities, something which we uh, didn't see this time around. I would also add, just based on my uh, time at the Department of Defense, an attack of the type that I describe could, under certain circumstances, rise above the threshold of armed conflict. You know, I I don't want to I don't want to derail the answers to my question, but I, I have a question specifically around that, and and you raised it so well, I I, I kind of can't help myself, but just toss it out there to think about, and we'll come back to it after after everyone answers this. But I I agree with you completely, and 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 I certainly don't have the uh, you know the expertise and the perspective that you do, but. I've adopted kind of a, a, a stance that, that the SolarWinds issue is not a hack or a breach the way it's constantly reported. I, I agree with you completely based on different things that I've read and, and, and meetings that I've been a part of that this was, a, this was an intelligence operation. And I'm, I'm not an intelligence professional, so I can't speak to it from experience. But from everything I've heard, it was exactly that. And, and what worries me is the connections of the dots between the different areas that that these operatives were in and, and watching for so long. And I don't think we've yet, you know, drawn out what those potential connections could truly mean. But I, it presents to me a watershed moment to change how we talk about cybersecurity in, in, in our industry and just in, in general discourse out, out there. So um, I'm glad, I'm, I'm not glad, but <laughs> for the purpose of our discussion, 
um, I'm glad I called on you first because that that's a, a very, very thought provoking response and one that I think concerns, at least from, from my perspective, concerns me um, significantly. Tracy, how about you? What, what keeps you up at night? Yeah, thanks, MJ. I would say there's many things that keep me up at night, but certainly I would say, you know, that with the magnitude of uh, attacks that are happening continuously in the cyber world, um, how do we help um, our partners stay ahead of those attacks? Um, you know, keeping it simple, right? Getting back to basics, like level, you know, very elementary skills that are lacking in the IT organizations today that are creating vulnerabilities for them, right? And their biggest risk, right? Uh, but also determining and looking at the right technology, services, education that we can help do with our partner community. And all of that is an extremely uh, um, uh, a lot of opportunity for everyone on this council, but also in from an IT uh, ownership that I feel we all owe um, to the entire cyber universe, really, to help elevate. So. That's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> Jacob, how about you? you? You must have an interesting perspective on what, what keeps you up at night regarding cyber threats. Yeah, absolutely. Um, twofold, really. Um, ransomware has been sort of the uh, the headline for a couple of years now. Um, for the insurance industry, um, you know, as cyber insurance has developed um, in the marketplace, we've certainly seen an evolution there. Um, frequency and severity has gone up. Uh, it's really for three different reasons from our perspective. Um, one, the introduction of cryptocurrency as a means of collecting ransom payments, that's made it a lot more effective. Um, and we think the criminals are, they're becoming more organized really. Um, they're using better tools to identify their targets and, uh, and they're working, they're collaborating, um, figuring out who can charge how much. Um, so that, those are some of the reasons why ransomware continues to be sort of, um, you know, the biggest issue that we and our policyholders faced, uh, are faced with. Um, if we think about what you just talked about, systemic risk uh, is certainly uh, top of mind for insurance companies. Um, this doesn't just have to be that sort of scenario, um, like the SolarWinds um, incident, but um, but just generally anything that will impact a large number of, of you know, policyholders for us in one uh, single instance. So if we go back to not Petya, of 2017, uh, a lot of similarities there um, with with the recent event, and um, that really showed the potential for systemic risk to impact uh, large portions of, portfol of portfolios for insurance carriers who operate in the cyber insurance space. Great, Jay. It's hard to top any of those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, when you start thinking about you know, you know when cyber becomes um, you know, armed uh, conflict. That that's that's a that's a whole new level that we haven't really gotten to yet. But but let's let's go back the other direction. Let, let's go back and talk about the you know, twenty nine or so million small businesses out there that don't know what they don't know. And I think that at the end of the day, cybersecurity, especially if you take you know a, a really talented IT team, you know any of our partners that just they know technology. What they don't know in security keeps coming back to hurt them because they think they have everything figured out, but there's all these other things going on and they don't have visibility. They're not seeing the activity coming in the networks. The, the small businesses don't have budget. And so they're having to, to, to balance you know, security with, with budget. And that's always an ongoing issue, which really kind of is probably what keeps me up at night. You know, How do we communicate risk? to any size organization. Like if, if I went to Microsoft, they, they get risk, right? I mean, they, they know where their data is and what it matters to them. But the, the smaller businesses out there, the ones that are the lifeblood of, of our economy and most of the economy worldwide, you know, just don't understand yet what that risk is to their business. And what it means to get hit by a ransomware attack, a business email compromise attack. You know, we, we, we talk about those things. You know, a few years ago, a ransomware attack was, you know, three or $4,000. You know, that, that's what it cost you to get out of it. And it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world for a small business. In Q3 of 2020, it jumped to $178,000. Uh, the FBI's last report on business email compromise, the average attack is $75,000 per complaint. And that, that's no longer a, a $1,000 worth of Visa gift cards. It's actually, you know, a substantial amount of money and that organized crime we just talked about is, is really causing, um, conflict for those small businesses 
that are already challenged with COVID and trying to, to work from home and everything else going on in that market. So I have no best answer. I think we have a lot of things we need to be solving for the next few years. Thanks, Jake. And Alex, what keeps you up at night with, uh, as far as cybersecurity threats go? A little bit of everything I already talked about, um, but just playing off of what Jay just mentioned, that an unexpected unknown is the biggest thing for me. There's the huge lack of education and awareness in a lot of companies that I walk into every single day. So whether it's you know lack of cybersecurity specific knowledge um, or just uneducated on where their sensitive data lives, um, like their personal identifiable information, their PII or their controlled unclassified information, their CUI peppered throughout their systems. And we ask when we go in and so often they'll say things like, oh, we don't have any sensitive data or we don't touch CUI. And we find it a little bit here, a little bit there, peppered throughout everything. Um, over access to privileged data, not functioning on least privilege. Um, a huge source that we see a lot um, that makes me very uneasy is a lack of communications internally. So the finance department doesn't talk to HR and they have the same sensitive data, but they're not using it in the same way and just not on the same page. Um, Really, at the end of the day, we're all only as strong as our weakest link. So just protecting those weaknesses when and wherever we can. It's a great point. You know, the, the last breach that I was involved with when I was with an MSP had literally almost nothing to do with technology. It had everything to do with the lack of business controls um, throughout the organization that, that allowed um, you know, what they thought was a cyber event. And you could make the argument that it was, but it really was just a, an exploitation of very poor business controls. So, you know, Jacob, you said something fascinating about, you know, the, the bad actors, you know, collaborating and, and, and sharing, you know, information on how they uh, achieve their nefarious goals. You know, that that's something that, 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 we've talked about a lot in the ISAO because, you know, one of the, one of the reasons that I, well, ISACs were originally created to focus on critical infrastructure, but ISAOs, you know, built on that to get, you know, different types of community sharing information for that very reason that, that the bad guys or gals are sharing information a heck of a lot better than those of us who like to think we're living on the, the, the good, guys and gals side of the fence, you know, that they're collaborating, sharing information on the dark web, how to take advantage of different exploits and whatnot. And so, you know, that's where, you know, an ISAO, which of course is near and dear to my heart, comes into play. And, and this whole concept of sharing information and best practices and building trusted communities and, and, and what I've come to say, getting away from cyber shaming to where organizations are willing and encouraged and 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 complimented for coming forward and saying you know we think we're seeing this particular thing going on is anyone else seeing it have we seen any similar activities and looking at cyber threat intelligence and and a big part of what we're trying to do is bring that threat intelligence into an understandable and actionable format for the thousands of MSPs that are CompTIA members who need to understand that there's more than just tools and technology to address this problem. You know, I'm interested in, in, in what each of you may think um, the role of an ISAO is in helping to make both our members and through them, their customers, all of our customers, more secure in the face of these ever evolving attacks. Jay, any, any thoughts for you? Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of the IT professionals out there that I talk to day in, day out, our partners all around the world are challenged with not enough time in the day to handle all the things that they're currently doing. Um, attracting talent is a challenge, right? So, so we know that there's 3.1 million unfilled cybersecurity positions uh, per, per ISC squared as of December. So who's going to, to do this work that needs to be done? So when you start taking the teams together and saying, hey, we saw this and you saw that and that team saw that and having a correlation engine to be able to look at that and say, hey, guys, you know, independently, these are not a big deal. But now that we're seeing trends and patterns, 
we can we can we, we can shorten the, the the time to response because of that ability to share data and share feeds. And I think you know that that's one of the first places where it all starts is how do we get that information out there, useful, actionable information in the hands of people that can make change and make a difference. I think the ISAO has been all about that. That's why you know, we are big supporters of, of the efforts that are going on you know, with CompTIA. NJ? Thanks. Tracy, you and I have had some some interesting conversations about this. Love, love to hear your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more, you know, with what has already been shared. You know, when you think about ISAL and the threat intelligence, right, getting to the point that we have so many vacant positions within the IT organizations today in cybersecurity, that's not changing. That's not that's a five plus year, you know, problem, right? And even still, it's gonna continue to magnify with the amount of threats. But when you think about getting the threat intelligence into the hands to where it can take actionable results, that's where you mitigate and you start to mitigate your risk. And it's all going to be around mitigating risk. And so it's got to be a philosophy and being incorporated into that whole entire security orchestration strategy within the company. And that's where, to me, the role of the ISL becomes extremely you know, compelling, in addition to the education opportunities, the collaboration opportunities, all of those are phenomenal capability, you know, capabilities that the ISL brings to the entire community too. Great, thanks. Alex, any thoughts on this for you? From the cybersecurity community perspective, it's also what's already been shared, but just that value of information sharing and having a greater awareness of these threats that are impacting um, individual products and just arming our community as a whole and the industry with better intelligence. It's pretty amazing. Great. Jacob, I don't know if this is a little bit outside your wheelhouse, but do, do you have any thoughts on, on the roles that ISAs and ISACs play? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we have a very sort of uh, common goal here as, as insurance industry and such organizations because Awareness is really the key to getting um, this issue remediated. Um, a lot of these issues are fairly basic issues that, um, you know, cause companies, especially SMEs, to be vulnerable to attacks. Um, it's it's simple uh, fixes in many instances. Um, you you don't you only have to do about a handful of things to prevent it. Um, so I think we do our best to act as uh, more than just you know someone who provides insurance. Uh, it's it's been a huge improvement in the industry over the past uh, year year and a half as ransomware particularly has has become an issue. Um, so I think policyholders are more receptive to uh, feedback beyond um, you know asking for a quote for for cyber insurance. So we um, I think we try and do our best to serve a similar purpose uh, and tell them um, shut remote desktop protocol because that's a leading exploit for ransomware delivery. Um, use multi-factor authentication. Um, some of some of those things that actually don't they don't cost much. It's just a configuration issue in many instances. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think the more we can do to get that message out there, it's really that's the biggest dis disconnect um, from my perspective. Is just they don't know how it applies to them. Um, what's the issue? And what's you know how much would it cost if if they got hit? Uh, and it's it's becoming pretty significant. Yeah, it's amazing that some of the simplest and and least expensive, you know, strategies are are still not being employed in so many areas. I think that's a that's a very good point. Sam, love your perspective on this. Sure. Um, I I would just add uh, that the sharing of cyber threat intelligence between the uh, the federal government uh, and the private sector that uh, factors very prominently. Uh, into the uh, you know emerging uh, relationship uh, uh, bet between the private sector and the public sector with regard to uh, cybersecurity and uh, securing our national critical infrastructure. I'd point out uh, that the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, I in fact identify the need to improve upon existing uh, private sector federal government information sharing programs to develop a shared picture of the threat environment and more proactively and comprehensively address cyber threats and vulnerabilities. Uh, the particular focus of uh, 
this recommendation from the Solarium Commission was uh, the need to engage more with the defense industrial base. And it, there, there are a lot of, I, I can say that there are a lot of really encouraging um, initiatives and conversations coming out of uh, Homeland Security in this area, and specifically some that are focusing on the SMB space, which is where a lot of us play and, and where a lot, of, um, a lot of our members are operating. And so it's good to see the government recognize that they've done a good job at the historical or traditional enterprise level, and they need to do a better job at the SMB level, which is where there are still far too many security incidents happening and not enough resources. So I want to circle back to solar winds, and, and it, it's you know as I said before, I think in in some respects it's unfair to, to refer to it as solar winds because it, it really it, it's not so much a solar winds event as it's a different kind of event than, than we've seen before. And it to me it 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 underscores what I've always said is an existential threat to our to our global economy and even the stability of societies. And, and I think that there's an opportunity here to change the nature of the conversation about cyber. It's, it's you know, back from my days running an MSP for almost 20 years and going through a couple acquisitions, it was always tools and technology, speeds and feeds. What do you need to throw in there to lock things down? And, and you know, I think what, what the SolarWinds event has shown us is that you can have the best defenses in the world. And if a determined actor is, is determined to get into your system, they will. And so to me, in, in some respects, the conversation almost needs to change to, you know, what it might be if your home got broken into, right? How did they get in? What time did they get in? What rooms did they go into? What did they see? What did they take, if anything? And, and perhaps most importantly, are they still in the house? Is it safe to go in or have they left? And if they left, did they leave the same way they came in? And, and so I think, you know, I think again, that that's where the sharing of threat intelligence and information and education and, and a much more well-rounded conversation about cyber needs to take place. It's yes, you have to build your best in class stack for sure, but you're not going to, you're not going to solve this problem by, by the stack alone. So would love to hear your perspectives on this. Um, Sam, let me start with you, just because I think you've got a, a, a truly fascinating you know, angle on this. Thank you very much. I would say that uh, the SolarWinds incident surely is a watershed moment, but uh, I don't think it is uh, an incident for which we have uh, no ideas uh, available to us about how to best respond and confront the challenges head on. Uh, I would highlight, you know, once again, the Solarium Commission highlighting the value within the Department of Defense's cyber strategy, this concept of deterrence by denial, uh, increasing the defense and security of cyberspace through both resilience and public private sector collaboration as part of a broader national strategy for securing cyberspace, cyberspace using all the instruments of national power. I, be, I believe, you know, many of you in the lead up to the 2020 general elections may have heard, uh, intelligence officials may have heard uh, folks from the FBI talk about a, uh, the need for the whole of government, a need for the whole of society uh, to address uh, uh, the, the cyber vulnerabilities uh, of our election system. Um, I think that whole of government approach is one that we would be uh, well advised to uh, continue to adopt uh, moving forward. And that's an approach where uh, defense of the nation from foreign cyber threats encompasses the collective responsibilities of law enforcement, mm -hmm. the critical infrastructure facing uh, role of the Department of Homeland Security, and in fact, the international reach of our uh, defense and intelligence communities. Interesting. Jay, um what are your thoughts in this area? <laughs> Aside from the obvious big sigh. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just, it doesn't end. And I think that's one of the things that, that we, we, we keep thinking that, you know, security has a magic bullet. And we know that we have to, you know, sacrifice convenience to get better security, whether it be, 
you know, configurations, multi longer passwords, multi-factor authentication. But when you start to think about where we are in this process, you know, so many people think that they can come and I just need to go get a tool or a technology to solve a problem, but they're not accounting for the policy that, that you should start with. Like, we don't have a technology problem. There's plenty of technology to go around, but getting, you know, policy and, and getting the, that, that practice in place first is going to take us, you know, as a, as a society, probably three or four more years before we really grasp the value of those controls and what they do for a business. Now, I get it. If, if you're dealing with, with businesses that are focused on um, compliance, you know, you're, you're, you're already facing those challenges, whether it be a CMMC or any of the others. So you're ahead of the game, but that's such a small fraction of the, of the total number of businesses that, that could be impacted. Now, take a step up and go look at, at SolarWinds. I, I think that while we may have classified it as a, a, a reconnaissance mission, I, is that because we caught them when we caught them? What would have happened if they would have been in for six more months? You know, the average attacker is in a business network 190 days before they've been identified. Mm. If we can catch them sooner, that's great. What if we actually caught this group early and they really did have other plans that we haven't even really gotten into, you know, war game in that particular scenario out because it, it's hard to fathom what could have happened with, with the access that they had. And, and, you know, we got lucky and, yeah. and that, 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 that's a tough way to look at things. But I think that if we get the governance right and, and we get it down to the masses, it's got to get out to everybody, then we can start to, to solve the rest of the problems with technology that makes sense for those individual businesses that are trying to protect their their core data, whatever is most important to them. Interesting. Alex? So I'm a firm believer that their silver line is not just about everything in life if you look hard enough. And I think that there are a lot of silver linings here, um, starting with a brand name that we all know in both the enterprise and SMB space to finally shed light on the challenges that have really existed for some time now and been overlooked or left in the dust because small to medium sized businesses just don't make it to the news as often as you know an enterprise organization. I think it highlights on the importance of the supply chain and everyone really needs to up their game to protect each other um, at the end of the day. Vendors have always been a source of risk. You know, a couple of years ago in that huge target breach, that was due to their HVAC company. So this has always been a challenge. It's just never been highlighted as much in the small to medium sized business arena. Uh, but, you know, to play on what everyone else just kind of said, proactive management is just so important. So whether it's cloud-based software, physical software being deployed, it doesn't matter. We have to anticipate the problems before they start. And, you know, patches, updates, auditing and logging resources, um, just anticipating the unknown and staying on top of compliance and security vulnerabilities wherever we can. And I love the idea of structure and compliance like Jay was touching on before, but no matter what, there just has to be processes and structure you know, you know, around that proactivity and the right systems and the right resources in place and vendor due diligence um, annually, like enterprise companies are supposed to do as well. Um, I just, there's negative publicity no matter what, right? Like, even though this was an enterprise government based situation, um, I'm still talking to partners every day in the MSP space that are affected and their clients are asking questions and have a lot of concerns. And, you know, this was not a SMB tool or a SolarWinds MSP tool situation, yet they're constantly, you know, dealing with this negative publicity and client concerns on a daily basis. So, I would like to think that it is more important than ever for MSPs to really take their security and uh, client data privacy seriously. We've been talking about this in our community since I've been on the community for years now, but really eating their own dog food and practicing what they preach and making sure that the MSP is secure in addition to protecting their clients. And hopefully this sheds light and really, you know, gets people moving in the right direction to protect themselves and their clients to a higher level. Great. 
Tracy, any thoughts for you? Yeah, I think everyone covered all the great points, right? I think when you think about the, to Jay's point, right? Uh, the solar winds attack isn't going to go away, right? There's always going to be attacks and the magnitude of those attacks continue to get more sophisticated, more targeted. And, you know, the, uh, the role has to be around defense, right? And certainly lowering our risk um, and exposure, and it has to be around resiliency. And so that's where everyone in the cybersecurity, cybersecurity industry has to be focused, right? Is around resilience. And, and how do we do that? I mean, it's certainly, you know, there's pieces around education, there's technology by all means, right? You could argue the fact around, you know, SOC as a service brings an enormous amount of opportunity with the threat intelligence. Um, within certainly the SMB space, right, where they don't have those level of experts. So there's many different things I think fundamentally will change um, and be a better outcome of this. Um, but it's going to continu continuously have to evolve. Where you know the the you know the game continues to get higher as stakes, right? Um, you know, I'm not a big better. I don't like to go to Vegas and lose money because I work too hard for my money. But at the same time, when you think about cyber, right, you're betting all the time. <laughs> And you have to put your bo your best defense forward, and it's got to be about lowering your your risk. And and essentially, whether that be on the insurance side, um, you know, your cost of risk is going to increase for your cyber insurance if you don't have the right practices and such. So this is to me uh, fundamentally, you know, the way the regulations and you know cyber will continue to always, and the government and local and state and regulations will continue to get you know, more uh, focused. And I think SMB, it's, it's going to be a market too, as well, where they're going to have to go downstream into some of those areas to help mitigate these level. Got it. So we've got about six and a half minutes left and, and, you know, no surprise. I knew this would be a very engaging and, and, and interesting conversation, but I, I do have one question that I want to direct to Jacob um, that I, that I'd like to, to get out there. And that's, you know, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I think the insurance industry has done a really good job of ratcheting up the pressure on not just technology companies, but all companies in, in terms of, you know, their focus on cyber. And, and in some cases, that's been because carriers are not renewing policies or carriers are having to raise the premiums considerably because on the renewal applications, the organizations aren't able to provide sufficient responses to, to, to satisfy the carrier that they're taking cyber seriously. I wonder if you have any advice for our listeners around, you know, what what a company like the Hartford is looking for in terms of mitigating risk and helping, you know, everyone be better when it comes to these cyber threats. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think one of the challenges historically has been um, people just weren't receptive to it. Um, the insurance industry has for a long time done risk control for property insurance, right? Send their engineers out to look at, you know, fireproofing and, and, and sprinkler and, and so forth. And this is just what we need to do now. And that's what we're starting to increasingly use um, automated tools for um, security risk assessment tools. And we can sort of, we use that obviously to choose which risks we're willing to insure based on what we see. But we also use it for, as a conversation starter, as a loss control um, service to say, this is what we see. Um, here is a report and we encourage you to make these changes such that you become a less attractive risk to the, uh, to the threat actors out there. So I think we, again, in that sort of connection between uh, small business particularly, who's, you know, they're particularly struggling with this. I think we have a, an important role to play other than just providing insurance uh, in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but the market has to be receptive. I think we're getting there now because um, ransomware, frankly, is is impacting so many companies out there. I think it's it's not a secret anymore. Um, and it, you know, there's, there's no longer a correlation between a huge ransom demand and size of business. Even at the small end, you can be asked, for significant money, right? Um, all that said, with, with what we talked about today, um, unfortunately, something isn't, you know, some of this isn't preventable, right? Um, the small business isn't going to stand much of a chance against a nation state actor um, with unlimited means. So, you know, how to fix that? I don't know. But if you bring it down to the scale of what happens all the time, which is sort of the microcosm of a supply chain attack which is the managed service provider issue that's been brought up a few times. Um, they are constantly being used for easy access to all the MSPs customers. 
Um, and that's that's probably something that can be fixed, um, not not easily, but it is fixable. Um, just having controls in terms of, you know, how how the MSP gets into the network, um, authentication uh, in all respects, whitelisting, so on and so forth. Those are, are basic things you can implement. Um, and I think if you can get that right, then you can start sort of moving up the uh, the sophistication scale and see uh, if you can also counter the the nation state threat. Um, that's, you know, I'd be lying if I said that's not our biggest concern um, because again, um, something that impacts a large portion of a portfolio um, has to be a concern for the insurance industry. Great. Anyone have any, any thoughts on that that you'd like to share? We've got about three and a half minutes to go. MJ, I'll jump in. You know, okay. Tracy mentioned before about being proactive. And, and I'd like to, to equate it to um, the fire department. And if you think about it from the perspective of as a service provider, everybody else is out there delivering IT services. You know, we are really good at, at running into fires. I'm not saying that, that we're the, the firefighter heroes or the first responders because they're way above and beyond. But when there's a problem, you know, those firefighters are going, you know, head first into the fire, to take on the challenge. And we've got to have those people. Frankly, going forward, we need to have more fire marshals. We need to spend more time analyzing, understanding the, the, the impact to the business from a cyber attack, figuring out where their data is. And I think we talked about that here a moment ago. You know, where is that data located? What does a third party risk look like to the business? Where is that data? You know, we, we, we rushed to work from home and now we've got people that are working from unknown, uncontrolled environments. Okay, so we say they're using a VPN, but they're not because we see it by the number of connections that are not coming into the firewalls at client sites. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we instill that, that proactive view in the world? And it boils down to culture and humans. You know, if, if we can get that right, that message right, so that they understand what's going on, and we can take more of a fire marshal approach to solving risk for our clients, then Jacob has less claims to worry about and we're all better off. Yep. Well, clearly you resonated with my puppy who chimed in with his little bark in the background. So speaking of working from home, you know, what panel wouldn't be complete without, without a pet or a kid chiming in as well? Well, listen, I just want to thank you all um, for participating. This has been a great discussion. Alex, Jacob, Jay, Sam, Tracy, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise.